It's beginning to rain, rain, rain in the voice of our Father. Saying, who with will come drink of this water? I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky. It's beginning. Hello friends, this is Tex Mars, inviting you to worship with us today at Bible Home Church, coming to you from Austin, Texas. This is Jerry Barrett, the pastor's assistant here at Bible Home Church. Please remember that Bible Home Church operates solely through your love gifts, tithes, and offerings. You can mail a check or money order to Bible Home Church, 5200 Evidence Cove, E V I D E N C E Cove, Spicewood, Texas, 78669. Don't forget to send in your prayer requests as well. We will be happy to add you to our prayer list, and we greatly appreciate your prayers for us. This week, we will begin a new series, Ways of the Serpent. We pray that you will receive a blessing from Pastor Mars's message. Up next is Cody Johnson with In the Garden, after which we will begin Pastor Mars's sermon. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my Closes and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy. And the sound of his voice is so sweet The birds hush their singing And the melody that he gave to me Within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy We tarry there, none other has ever known. I stay in the garden with him, though the night be falling. Oh 
Nobody bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Well, today we're going to begin a, a very important series. And I, I want to tell you, first of all, that I have never, ever done radio program more important than this series. We're going to be discussing ways of the serpent, ways of the serpent. And I want to subtitle this series this way. I call it, I describe it as the theory and practice of hell and Illuminism. The theory and practice of hell and Illuminism. And of course, that gives it an academic meaning and perspective, does it not? Because in the academic world, they love to use the word theory. But in fact, this is the science and practice of hell and Illuminism. It is a tale, a story, a fact, a scientific fact involving the implanting of the double mind. Now, you know, God has taken you and he's taken me, and I am convinced every true patriot Christian I have ever met, I discover when within five or ten minutes of talking to a person, asking them a little bit about themselves, I find out a mountain of knowledgeable, useful information. For one thing, I often find in my first five or ten minutes of discussion with an individual, whether or not they're a true Christian, but more than that, I find that God has chosen each person, man or woman, for his kingdom because of a special gift or talent that they have. Now, you may say, boy, Tex, I've met a lot of people, and I don't know if they have any talent or gifts at all. Oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. Every person chosen by God, selected by God, justified through faith by God and his son, Jesus Christ, every person has a special individual talent and gift, and no one else in the universe can do it but them. Now, the, the key to success in life is to, for you to know what your gift is. Now, I, I'm not really going to talk about gifts today or talents uh, that is a very valuable topic. And I, I just want you to understand that every person has this gift or talent. Now, I have one too. There's a lot of things I can't do. I've admitted that. I'm totally incompetent. I'm totally inept <laughs> at many things, believe me. And probably if you met me for five or 10 minutes, you'd probably see that. You'd say, well, doesn't like doesn't look like Texas is going to ever qualify to be a soccer player at the World Cup. 
Doesn't look like Texas is going to play a championship game of tennis. Uh, doesn't look like Tex, you know, put me on the piano and say, I don't think he's ever going to be a musician. I said, okay. If you listen to my voice singing, you'll say, well, boy, it's good that he has a good radio voice. Or at least many people say that I do. Because he sure cannot sing. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, God knows all those things and many more about me. So he's decided he will give me other talents that I can use for his kingdom. And that's the purpose. The purpose isn't so it's going to uplift you or me. The purpose of giving a gift or talent, that's God giving that, is so you can use it for his kingdom. He's the only one that matters. If you ever get that in your head, my friends, it will change your life. God is the only one that ever matters. You don't matter at all. I don't matter at all. Now, thanks to his goodness and his mercy and his love, we can live a happy, prosperous, perfectly joyous life, which you cannot live if you don't have God. You're sunk. But nevertheless, when it comes down to the essence of life, the mystery of life, as they call it, the elixir of life, if you want to take a sip of it, it's simply this. You're here to serve God. And that's all. That's the end of your life. And in Hebrews, it says, it is appointed for a man once to die, not a thousand times as in reincarnation, but once afterward the judgment. That pretty well sums up your life story. But in that life story, there is a talent or a gift. Now, one thing that God has done for me, as he's done for many people, is he trains you and mentors you and brings you up. I mean, you're like a child. He admonishes you sometime, spanks you, keeps you in line. And if he does not chasten you, then you're not his child. I mean, you don't go to your next door neighbors, take out a belt and start spanking them, do you? You're going to go to prison. You can be arrested for that. But if you're a child of God, he has the right and he will chasten you. And thank God that he does. You're going down the wrong path, young man, young lady. Now you're my child and I'm not going to allow that. And I'm the only thing that matters. I'm God. You say, well, wait just a minute, God. How about me? I'm, a, I'm better. I'm a, I'm a worthwhile individual. I'm a valuable person. Shut up. You're a worm. But God can make something out of you anyway. <laughs> He's made a lot of worms into beautiful creatures. He's a creator. He's a gift. One of my most favorite gospel songs is by a woman named Dottie Rambo. She's passed away now, but it was called The Painting. Oh, she was ugly, she said. And she had eyes stained with tears because she had, had misery in her life. But then God took out his brush and his paints and he painted a new picture, an image of Miss Rambo, the painting. And it was beautiful and lovely. Well, that's what God does with people's lives. We make messes of them. He throws the mess out and makes a whole new image and picture of you and me. Now, I'll tell you that because God has made me in a certain way. One of the things God has done is brought me through all kinds of things. I have degrees and knowledge that no one else has. And I'm going to use that today because I'm going to talk to you about the ways of the serpent, the theory or the science and practice of hell and the Illuminism, the implanting of the double mind. And if you will listen very carefully, and if you will get pencil and paper or pen and paper and take notes, I promise you, you will learn something so valuable, so amazing that it will, it, it will stay with you for the rest of your life. I'm going to tell you how every satanic system works. I'm going to give you the very doctrine of hell. Now, there is a doctrine of godliness too. It's a mystery to most people. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will know the doctrine of my father. Wow. People say, oh, don't worry about doctrine. People argue over doctrine all day long. I don't, I don't fight over doctrine. Well, you don't know anything then. You're not even a Christian. Because Jesus said, if you know me as Lord, you will know the doctrine of him who sent me. There is a doctrine of Christ. 
Now, I want to assure you, I want to start with that doctrine, that basis, which is this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's the doctrine. Now, there's other elements of it, but in essence, that's it. No other foundation can a, land, uh, can a man lay than Jesus Christ. Do you have a cracked foundation and slab? It's, it's useless. It's worthless. Have you built a house on sand, shifting sand? Watch out. It just drifts right on out to sea when the next tide comes in, perhaps. You see, Jesus had standards. He had absolutes. He had doctrine. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the satanic system in the world and politics and religion in education, in culture, in entertainment that is built on a system called double mind or double think. Even George Orwell talked about it. We'll mention Mr. Orwell in his book 1984 as we go along here. But what I want you to understand is that the code of hell is based on a doctrine of the double mind, the implanting of the double mind, and you and I cannot escape this implanting every day of our lives except through the protection and hedge that Jesus Christ will give you. Now, please understand, just as I told you, it says in Hebrews 9 verse 27, it is appointed for a man once to die afterward the judgment. That is an absolute I know the Buddhists will say different. The Hindus will say different. The Masons will say different. But we have a biblical absolute. And this is what happens when you read of the life of Jesus. They came to him and said, is it right for a man to divorce? Well, Jesus said it was not so from the beginning. It's not what God intended. When Jesus really let it be known who he was, in the Gospel of John, it says most of his disciples, except the 12, abandoned him. And it makes clear in the Gospel why they did, because they murmured, they complained among themselves, and they said, who can stomach this? This is a hard saying. These are hard things. Who can stomach them? Friends, let me tell you something. If you cannot stomach the doctrine of Christ, then get out. I was in the Air Force for over 20 years. And back during the days of the draft, many people were trying to avoid going in the Army. They didn't want to go in and fight in Vietnam, so they would join the Air Force. Their, their, their numbers came up, you know, in the lottery is high, and they, they knew they were about to be drafted in the Army. Rather than go in the Army, they'd go join the Air Force. But they weren't very happy campers. They were always complaining and, and moaning, I didn't really want to come in the Air Force. I just came in because I was avoiding the draft. I didn't want to go in the Army, fight and die. So they were crummy airmen, didn't do their job sometimes. Well, finally, the draft ended. The war in Vietnam was over, and the draft ended. And the Air Force didn't need so many troops. It was cutting back from like 980,000 troops down to 700,000. Had a lot of people that were going to kick out. They didn't need so many. So we had an Air Force general then, four-star general, chief of staff of the Air Force. He came out with a policy. I liked it. And I, I gave the, the, the order to many of my men under my command, all the way in or all the way out. Well, that's what Jesus says. You're all the way in or you're all the way out. There's a verse in the Bible I've always loved of Jesus. It says, if thine eye be single, then thy whole body will be full of light. Hmm. If thine eye be single, then thy whole body will be full of light. If you are single-minded and you refuse to bend, if you look upon something as an absolute and say, no, I don't see any black and white. I see only the white, only the light. I'm not going to mix in the gray. I'm not going to mix them together. The light cannot tolerate darkness, and darkness should not be part of the light. Jesus 
also said in Matthew 6, he said, if therefore the light is that that is in thee, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? The darkness cannot live in coexistence with the light. You're either evil or you're good. You know, one time a young man came to me and he began to tell me, well, there's good things in Hinduism. There's good things in Buddhism. I'm a Christian, but, you know, I have to recognize the good in these other religions. So can't, you know, just can't we all sort of get along? I looked at the young man. There were several people around. I said, well, let's just say that I'm a Satanist. I'm a high priest of Satan. You know, young man, in three minutes' time, I can turn you into a Satanist. He said, no, no, you can't do that. I said, oh, yes. You want to see me do it? He said, well, okay. I said, now, thank God I'm not really a Satanist because I'm going to turn you into Satanist in three minutes using your arguments. And you know what? By the time that three minutes was up, the man was absolutely amazed. He had become a Satanist. Because I said, do you think there's anything at all good in Satan? Well, yeah, he used to be a good angel. Ah, so he was a good angel. Do you think that a lot of people could be rehabilitated, even murderers in prison? Well, yes. Ah, so Satan could be rehabilitated. And I just went on from there. I said, let's dialogue. Well, let's have a little dialogue here. I said, well, tell me this. You say that there are these Hindus and everything. You say they do good. How about Satanist? Did you know that there's Satanist who have given money to charities? No, I didn't know that. Oh, so, oh, yes. Yes, they have. Do you think that's a good thing? Yes. Would you and would you embrace that? Yes. Would you work with them in those charities? Yes. So you think, then you agree that Satans could be good humanitarian and charitable people? Yes, I do. See, so pretty soon he was going and going, and he's using the same arguments, and pretty soon I had him by my grasp. And I said, pretty soon I, I was able to tell him there's no difference between God and Satan. And he was just totally confused. I had to straighten the man out. I'd take another three minutes to show him the scriptures. And I said, your error is in you don't know the doctrine of Christ. If you're thirsty and dry, look to the sky. It's beginning to rain. You've been listening to Pastor Tex Mars and Bible Home Church. Please join with us in worship next week as we continue to honor the remarkable Word of God. It's beginning to rain, rain, rain in the voice of our Father. Saying, whosoever will come drink of this water, I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky, it's beginning. Hello friends, this is Tex Mars, inviting you to worship with us today at Bible Home Church, coming to you from Austin, Texas. This is Jerry Barrett, the pastor's assistant here at Bible Home Church. Please remember that Bible Home Church operates solely through your love gifts, tithes, and offerings. You can mail a check or money order to Bible Home Church, 5200 Evidence Cove, E V I D E N C E Cove, Spicewood, Texas, 78669. Don't forget to send in your prayer requests as well. We will be happy to add you to our prayer list, and we greatly appreciate your prayers for us. This week, we continue the series, Ways of the Serpent. We pray that you will receive a blessing from Pastor Mars's message. Up next is Dottie Rambo with The Artist, after which we will begin Pastor Mars's sermon. <laughs> Lifted the canvas and sketched each line carefully. I watch 
the blackness of sin. But thank God He didn't leave me there. Hallelujah. I looked in the eyes of the artist. Oh, I trembled and I reached for his hand. And I cried, oh, Master, Creator. Transform me and paint me again. So Paul, he just smiled and he lifted the canvas. And thank God, he just started all over again. Isn't that great news? Remote. The end. Oh, how graceful the touch of his hand. And here's what he did for me. He began to tell me, well, there's good things in Hinduism. There's good things in Buddhism. I'm a Christian, but, you know, I have to recognize the good in these other religions. So can't, you know, just can't we all sort of get along? I looked at the young man. There were several people around. I said, well, let's just say that I'm a Satanist. I'm a high priest of Satan. You know, young man, in three minutes time, I can turn you into a Satanist. He said, no, no, you can't do that. I said, oh, yes. You want to see me do it? He said, well, okay. I said, now, thank God I'm not really a Satanist because I'm going to turn you into Satanist in three minutes using your arguments. And you know what? By the time that three minutes was up, the man was absolutely amazed. He had become a Satanist. Because I said, do you think there's anything at all good in Satan? Well, yeah, he used to be a good angel. Ah, so he was a good angel. Do you think that a lot of people could be rehabilitated, even murderers in prison? Well, yes. Ah, so Satan could be rehabilitated. And I just went on from there. I said, let's dialogue. Well, let's have a little dialogue here. I said, well, tell me this. You say that there are these Hindus and everything. You say they do good. How about Satanist? Did you know that there are Satanists who have given money to charities? No, I didn't know that. Oh, oh yes. Yes, they have. Do you think that's a good thing? Yes. Would you would you embrace that? Yes. Would you work with them in those charities? Yes. So you think, then you agree that Satan's could be good humanitarian and charitable people? Yes, I do. See, so pretty soon he was going and going, and he's using the same arguments, and pretty soon I had him by my grasp. And I said, pretty soon I, I was able to tell him there's no difference between God and Satan. And he was just totally confused. I had to straighten the man out. I'd take another three minutes to show him the scriptures. And I said, your error is in you don't know the doctrine of Christ. There is no good in Hinduism. There is no good in Buddhism. There's no good in Judaism or Islam. 
There's only evil. There's only darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? The devil always comes as an angel of light. That's how he deceives. The Bible says the Antichrist will even come with signs and wonders and miracles. A miracle man. Wow. Who could possibly make war against him? They will look upon him, the Bible says, with admiration. Not with scorn. But I want to tell you something, my friends. The devil's people, the devil's religions, the devil's ways can look attractive and good. My good friend, Johanna Michelson, who got involved in Satanism and occultism and believed she was communicating with Jesus, but it was a devil who named himself Jesus. The devil sometimes even comes and says, I'm Jesus. Helen Shookman, a Jewish atheist psychologist from New York State, wrote a devil Bible. A devil Bible, that's what it really is. It's called A Course in Miracles. Doesn't it have a pretty name? It's big. It's bigger than our Bible, the Christian Bible. It's sold throughout the United States in bookstores. And Oprah Winfrey fell for it. And she's been telling everybody about this A Course in Miracles and how wonderful this A Course in Miracles book is. Helen Shookman, the atheist psychologist, the Jew, was asked, how did you get this new Bible, A Course in Miracles? She said, well, a spirit came to me and said, write this down. And they asked her, well, who was that spirit? She said, quote, it said it was Jesus. It said it was Jesus. Well, this Jesus told Dr. Shookman that one of the things to write down in the book was that he and Lucifer are brothers. That's just one of thousands of errors. It also said there's really no evil in the world. Everything is illusion. And there's really no sin in the world. So there's no hell. Doesn't Oprah Winfrey love that? She's a lesbian living with her lesbian lover. Doesn't she love that? No wonder she takes in this false Bible. But it talks about how much you need to love everybody. I mean, this is the key to A Course in Miracles, to love everybody, regardless of their faults. Unconditional love. Well, that sounds like God. Or does it? A message from hell, double-minded, even presenting Jesus and Lucifer as brothers. But people believe in it because it has some elements of good. Yeah. Yeah. Sure thing. Now, I want to talk to you about this quality called the double mind. I want you to understand, whether it's Marx's dialectical materialism or communism, as it's often called, Gorbachev called it the conflict of opposites. Whether it's the conflict of opposites, or Darwin, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, or the Jesuits who came up with a certain format for Jesuitical arguments or dialogue, whether it's the ancient Tao of the Orient, T-A-O, the Tao, whether it's David Easton's systems theory that's very popular among political scientists today, or the Hindu's Maya philosophy or illusion, the Persian Zoroaster's Zindavesta teachings, whether it's the Jews' Kabbalism and Talmudic thinking, all of these theories boil down to the implanting of the double mind. You will understand evolution and why it's a lie from the devil. You will understand why the, uh, the, the Taoism philosophy you know, you have the yin-yang symbol with the backward S of Satan, and on one side is the light, and on one side is the darkness. You've seen it with the martial arts studios, and the little point in each one. Satan is in each one, each side, light and darkness, and he's brought together within the framework of a circle. That's the yin-yang sign of Taoism. 
You see, the black and the white are brought together. There are many symbols throughout society that point to the implanting of the double mind. Now, what's important about the double mind? Well, here's where the beauty of the talent that God has given me. Now, I've admitted that there's a lot of places I'm not talented in. But, you know, God had me go get a master's degree in education. And my emphasis in the educational program at North Carolina State University many years ago was in psychology, the psychology of learning. And I've always had a special interest in psychology. In fact, I taught psychology of adult adjustment, a, a, a senior level course for a university. And then, of course, I have a degree, graduated summa cum laude from Park University in Kansas City, Missouri, in political science with a minor in business. And then I had 20 years in the Air Force in communications electronics and teaching World War III and all kind of things at the University of Texas. So God has put all these things together. One of the things that I studied the most when I was getting my degree in political science, I was interested in the psychopathology of politicians. I found out a lot of them were psychopaths. I read every book, every article I could get on the psychopathology of politics. Politics isn't just learning you know, how many congressmen there are and the three branches of government and the duties of the president. No, 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 it's much more than that. It's a process. It's a system. It's a satanic system. It's psychopathological. It's insane. But you, you, you do not understand politics un, until you understand the insanity and you have to separate yourself and be a sane person. Or you'll go right into the loony bin with all the rest of the Democrats and Republicans and Libertarians and so forth. Maybe the Tea Party people have a little picture of that insanity. And they're trying to escape the loony tunes of society. They're saying, I don't want Democrats and Republicans. I don't want to vote for the lesser of two evils anymore. Well, thank God. Good for them. But unless they learn the double mind concept, unless they learn the theory and practice of hell and the illuminism, the ways of the serpent, they're going to get caught up again in this double mind. They're going to think, well, by supporting the Republicans, we're doing good. Aldous Huxley wrote a pretty frightening book called Brave New World. It touched on the seduction of humanity by a psychological dictatorship. That's what we're talking about, how people have been psychologically, psychologically conditioned. They've been turned into zombies, into robots. You know, I wrote the classic book, the personal robot book. First book in the whole world to talk all about personal robots. I wrote the book, the whole universe catalog of robots, Robotica. I wrote the first book ever in the world called Careers with Robots. <laughs> That's right. You want a job working with robots? Okay, you can have one. I wrote a book about it. The first book ever. Probably still I can get, get it. It might be at libraries or something today. I've written a lot of very unusual books. Let's put it that way. In my lifetime. But I need to write a new book called The Human Robot. Because men have been turned into robots by psychology. They're slaves. Now, Aldous Huxley, the Brit, wrote about that in his book, Brave New World. L listen to what he said. He said, quote, it is perfectly possible for a man to be out of prison and yet not free. To be under no physical constraint, yet be a psychological captive compelled to think, feel, and act as the representative of the national state or some other private interest within the nation wants him to think, feel, and act. Huxley went on to explain, he said, the nature of psychological compulsion is such that those who act under constraints remain under the impression that they are acting on their own initiative. The victim of manipulation does not know that he is a victim. To him, the walls of his prison are invisible. He believes himself 
to be free. Friends, there are 300 million Americans, the most of whom believe they are free, and yet they are in slavery, they're in chains, they're in bondage, if not to the devil, to some system organized by devilish men. But they believe they're free. They've been propagandized and flattered so much. Oh, the land of the living and the, or the land of the free and the brave and all this. Stuff. They, they've sang all these songs. They really think we are free. A man wrote me a letter just last week, and he said, why are you so opposed to President Obama? After all, the people willingly and voluntarily voted him in office. Friend, there hasn't been any voluntary and willing election in America for a long, long time. You are deceived. In fact, Louis Farrakhan, the head of the black Muslims, know more than you do because he was on TV. I believe it was on the Barbara Walters show. He was being interviewed. And he was talking about his good friend, Barack Obama, from Chicago. They're both Chicagoans. And, and, and he was asking about Obama. And Farrakhan, head of the black Muslims, said, did you know, do you understand that Barack Obama was selected before he was elected? <laughs> Barack Obama was selected before he was elected. There's no free vote in America. You've been deceived. You're a victim. You've been manipulated. You're in prison. And you can't even see the walls. They're invisible to you. Now let's talk some more about the implanting of the double mind. Eve in the garden said something interesting, Genesis 3.13. She said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat of the forbidden fruit. Hmm. The serpent beguiled me. He used magic, witchcraft, enchantment. That's what the implantation of the double mind. Now, here's how Satan did it. You see, there was a doctrine, a doctrine that was given to Eve. God told her certain things, all right, that she should do and not do. And she knew exactly who she was, what she was, and what she was to do. She and Eve, uh, Adam, excuse me, her husband. But Satan, as Lucifer, the serpent, comes up and encounters her there in the garden. And he said to her something quite interesting. He said, why don't you eat this fruit? She said, I can't. That's the forbidden fruit. God told us not to eat of that tree. And or we would die. And Satan very cleverly and craftily said something. He, it, he implanted the double mind. He said, surely has God said that? But you will not die if you eat of it. Surely did God say that? He questioned God. Of course, he was a rebe re rebel from the beginning. There in heaven, he was cast out. He and his fellow angels, one third of the residents of heaven, for this rebellion. Now he's on earth and he's stirring up a rebellion among the only two people on this planet at that time. Surely has God said, If you're thirsty and dry, look to the sky, it's beginning to rain. You've been listening to Pastor Tex Mars and Bible Home Church. Please join with us in worship next week as we continue to honor the remarkable Word of God. It's beginning to rain, rain, rain in the voice of our Father. Saying, whosoever will come drink of this water, I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky, it's beginning. Hello friends, this is Tex Mars, inviting you to worship with us today at Bible Home Church, coming to you from Austin, Texas.
This is Jerry Barrett, the pastor's assistant here at Bible Home Church. Please remember that Bible Home Church operates solely through your love gifts, tithes, and offerings. You can mail a check or money order to Bible Home Church, 5200 Evidence Cove, E V I D E N C E Cove, Spicewood, Texas, 786. Six, nine. Don't forget to send in your prayer requests as well. We will be happy to add you to our prayer list, and we greatly appreciate your prayers for us. This week, we continue the series, Ways of the Serpent. We pray that you will receive a blessing from Pastor Mars's message. Up next is the cathedrals with We Shall See Jesus after which we will begin Pastor Mars's sermon. As thousands were faint, he touched the blind eyes, he looked and he moved.
Now let's talk some more about the implanting of the double mind. Eve in the garden said something interesting, Genesis 3.13. She said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat of the forbidden fruit. Hmm. The serpent beguiled me. He used magic, witchcraft, enchantment. That's what the implantation of the double mind. Now here's how Satan did it. You see, there was a doctrine, a doctrine that was given to Eve. God told her certain things, all right, that she should do and not do. And she knew exactly who she was, what she was, and what she was to do. She and Eve, uh, Adam, excuse me, her husband. But Satan, as Lucifer, the serpent, comes up and encounters her there in the garden. And he said to her something quite interesting. He said, why don't you eat this fruit? She said, I can't. That's the forbidden fruit. God told us not to eat of that tree. And or we would die. And Satan very cleverly and craftily said something. He, he implanted the double mind. He said, surely has God said that? But you will not die if you eat of it. Surely did God say that? He questioned God. Of course, he was a rebe rebel from the beginning. There in heaven, he was cast out. He and his fellow angels, one-third of the residents of heaven, for this rebellion. Now he's on earth and he's stirring up a rebellion among the only two people on this planet at that time. Surely has God said, you know, can you really trust God? That's not so. Go ahead and eat of it. It's good. And Eve said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Her problem was she communicated with a serpent. She carried on a dialogue with him. She listened to him, and she tried to use her human reason. Did you know that in the French Revolution, the Illuminists rejected the God of the Bible and Christianity in its entirety and substituted a new God, a God that they call simply the God of reason? Human reason substituted for God. This is how Satan implants the double mind. The Bible has a doctrine, but Satan comes along and says, well, wait, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Let's discuss this. Let's carry on a dialogue. Friends, don't talk with the devil. He's a lot more clever than you, and God is more clever than you and him. Why don't you listen to God? Don't listen to the devil. That's what the Al Gores and the Bill Clintons and all the others of this world do, and you're going to just be lost, and you're going to end up in the insane loony bin just like they are. You've got to separate yourself. You've got to come out of that world system. You've got to be an individual answerable only to God. And knowing God's doctrine and the opposition of the world be damned. And you cannot condone what the world does. You must condemn it. And you must be flat out absolute on your condemnation. Some years ago, I was talking with the top lieutenant, you might call him, of Dr. Charles Stanley, First Baptist Church of Atlanta. And I was telling him of my great disappointment that Dr. Stanley, who has many a fine uh, qualities about him, nevertheless is a coward because he doesn't want to oppose abortion or homosexuality. He doesn't want to uh, oppose occultism and the New Age movement and all these things. And false teachers in the church, Dr. Stanley is, uh, is frightened to death to mention anything about false teachers in the church. So I was telling his top lieutenant, Dr. So-and-so, uh, his name is immaterial, but I was telling him of my great disappointment in Dr. Stanley. And he said, well, you don't understand text. I said, oh, I don't? He said, no, Dr. Stanley neither condones nor does he condemn those things. And I said to him, well, how brilliant. Well, how magnanimous, how wonderful of Dr. Stanley. 
He doesn't condone those things, nor does he condemn those things. Well, you know, that's a lot different than Jesus Christ, who did not condone sin, but instead condemned it. Oh, you're one of those old-fashioned fundamentalists. <laughs> Dr. Stanley is more modern and progressive. Yes, indeed, he is. Do not condone. Instead, yes, condemn. The Bible says we are to exercise righteous judgment. Well, now, Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. You don't know the Bible at all, what it says there. Jesus said, when you judge, you should judge righteously and make sure what you judge is based on what God says instead of what the world says, okay? So you don't judge somebody based on the world standards, and especially if you're a hypocrite. You don't talk about another man falling into adultery if you're doing it yourself. You don't talk about another person who's a cheat and a liar if you yourself are a cheat and a liar. That's not righteous judgment. That's hypocritical judgment. That's all Jesus was talking about. In the next verse, in that same passage of the Bible, in Matthew, Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine, or they'll turn around and rend you. They'll bite you. They'll eat you alive. A little paraphrase in there. How do you know the swine? How do you know the pigs? Unless you judge them. That man is a swine. And I'm going to stay away from him. And I condemn him for being a swine. And I don't want to have anything to do with him. John says in the Bible that when these people bring false doctrines to you, don't have any fellowship with them. Close your door. Don't invite a man to eat, to sup with you. Oh, it's so judgmental. Yeah, well, when you get to heaven, ask for John and complain to him. And let's see how much, you know, <laughs> dialogue he gives you. In fact, if you complain about being friends with the devil's people, you don't have to worry about going to heaven and meeting up with John and talking about it with him. You, you're not going. Amos said something in the Bible, the great Old Testament prophet. He said, can two walk together lest they be agreed? Paul said, you can't drink from the same cup as devils. You can't do it. That's the double mind, dear friends. You can't say, well, look at all the good things about Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and Judaism. Well, at least the Jews, they believe in the Old Testament. Well, isn't that good? The Bible says, the Apostle John again says, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. If you don't believe in Jesus, you don't have the Father. The Jews don't have the Father. Well, they worship God. No, they don't worship God. They worship the devil. Well, how about the Muslims? They, they have God. They just call him Allah. That's the same God as our God. No, it's not the same God. Our God has a son named Jesus Christ, and he's one with the Father. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The Bible says there are three that bear record in heaven, and these three are one. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's three are one. The Muslim Bible says, or Quran, I don't even call it a Bible, but Quran, says Jesus was faked by the Christians. He never died on the cross and was resurrected. He was just a prophet. He was lesser a prophet than Muhammad. That's not God. God doesn't teach that. You've got to have absolutes. You've got to have the doctrine of Christ, which is the doctrine of God. There is no separation between God and Jesus. I and the Father are one. Friends, be single-minded. Be absolute. Set your mind like flint. Be an iron man or woman. Do not change. Don't bring in the day and the night. Don't try to add the light and the darkness into your life. You'll become a shadow, a gray, worthless person destined for darkness. Outwardly, people can look good. Outwardly, they can look great. But Jesus says don't judge on their outward appearance. A Muslim imam, they can say, oh, he's a great holy man. 
the Dalai Lama of Tibetan Buddhism. Oh, what a wonderful person. Doesn't he smile all the time? Isn't he a great person? The Sai Baba, the Hindu guru. Oh, he's done miracles. What a wonderful miracle-working man. Jesus said something interesting, though. He, he warned of those who outwardly looked so pious and holy, but inwardly they were full of devils. He says they're like whited sepulchers. You know what that is, friends? That's a coffin. That's a casket. You take a casket and you paint it with white paint or whitewash. It's still got a dead person in it. And these people are from the congregation of the dead, and there is nothing good in them. No, not one thing. And the things that look good on the outward side, on the external, are simply that way to deceive you, to bring you into the fold. The coffin door that's painted white opens up, and you are laid in there with a dead man, and then they nail the coffin with you and the body of the corpse together forever in hell. Think about that. You and the corpse and the whole congregation of the dead in hell forever simply because you have a double mind. I want to talk to you more about this code of hell. By the way, that's what Mirabeau, he was one of the leaders of the French Revolution, the Illuminist. That occurred right about the time now, 1776, the Order of the Illuminati was founded by Adam Weishaupt who's at least some Christians at the time understanding what was really going on said he, Weishaupt, is a human devil. Reminds me of what Lee Harvey Oswald evidently was quoted as saying one time. He was asked by somebody, this before he was arrested and then murdered for the assassination of JFK, and he was murdered by Jack Ruby, also known as, accurately, his real name was Jack Rubenstein. But Lee Harvey Oswald said, I'm involved with men who are quite evil. I believe he told his wife, Marina, that one time. She said, who are these men? He said, Marina, you have no understanding. You don't understand. These men are human devils. He was involved in one way or another with the assassination, but I don't think he pulled the trigger. And if he did, he wasn't the only one. But he told his wife, these people I'm involved with are human devils. And they're double-minded. Every human devil, whether he's in politics or Hollywood or our culture, our music, our education system, whether he's a medical doctor, a dentist, whatever he's in, is double-minded. James, the brother of Jesus, talked about such people. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. How many ways? All. And then James warned Christians, he says, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Read about it in the book of James. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Now, George Orwell had something to say about this system of double-mindedness. And I'm going to give you that, and that's all I can give you today. We're going to be finished up, and next week we're going to talk about the, the most important part of this double-minded doctrine of the devil that's into every satanic system on earth. But here's what George Orwell wrote in his book, 1984. He says, he talked about double-mindedness, but really he called it double-think. He said, double-think means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. <laughs> Double thing is the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them as true and valid. That's double think, the double mind. And Satan has implanted this psychological bind in billions of men's and women's minds. If you're thirsty and dry, look to the sky, it's beginning to rain. You've been listening to Pastor Tex Mars and Bible Home Church. Please join with us in worship next week as we continue to honor the remarkable Word of God.